So, as you guys know, I've been covering the Mike Bickle scandal for a few weeks now. I was just a fan of IHOP who followed the ministry closely for many years and was supporting my friend as a missionary that was down there full time. Never in a million years did I think I'd be doing a video like this, nor do I want to do a video like this. I'm doing it because it's necessary. But this week, the advocate group released some videos this week. They are a group of former longtime executives with IHOP and close friends with Mike Bickle who brought the allegations to light. It's a group of several men who are standing to want to see truth brought to light. And for those that don't have four hours to watch the videos that they put out this week, I'm going to give you the main highlights. Up to now, they have only really printed stuff on social media. But now these videos have come out, which gives us a chance and an intimate look at how the whole situation unfolded, what happened behind the scenes, and to hear the whole story. You're going to want to see this video. It's a must-see. Even if you're not really concerned about the ICOP situation, there are greater implications for the whole church, broadly. In being involved with several high-profile churches over years, this is actually not one of the worst things I've seen. This is actually more on the milder side, if you could actually believe that. I've seen such much, much worse. One church I was involved with, the pastor was a fairly large established church, was having gay sex with a man in the church over a long period of time, and some of the encounters were even rape. Then they went out onto the preaching circuit and preached in all the largest churches all over America until lawsuits brought this to light. But honestly, to tell you the truth, even to this day, that whole situation was never exposed and never brought into the light. People worked under the guise of just be silent, don't gossip, don't talk about this stuff, touch not the Lord's anointed, and some of this stuff was never fully brought to light. The church has major issues that need to be addressed, and I feel this year we will see many other high-profile ministries that will need to be exposed, as well as a long trail of high-profile scandals in the past as Robbie Zacharias, Bill Hybels, etc. So let me just show you an article from Christianity Today. So Christianity Today said that basically, above reproach, fewer Americans see pastors as ethical. Okay, and you're going to hear some more shocking details. Americans are having a harder time trusting anyone these days, including pastors. The country's perception of clergy hit a new low in recent Gallup polling, with fewer than a third of Americans rating clergy as the most highly and honest and ethical. People are more likely to believe in moral standards held by nurses, police officers, chiropractors, than other religious leaders. Clergy are still trusted more than politicians, lawyers, and journalists. So if we go down on the page, we're going to see <clears throat> the professions ranked by ethical standards according to the Gallup poll. Nurses being at the top of the list with 78% trust them, and veterinarians at 65%, way down the list even below police officers, which everything that happened with the rioting across America, um, basically to think that clergy could be seen less reliable than, than police officers is almost unheard of, and even chiropractors. So clergy stand at 32%. Uh, members of Congress ranked at 6%. <laughs> so basically you're seeing this, that this clergy, people trust their clergy at a 32% rate. So you have a major problem here in America and the churches that need to be addressed, and we need to address these things now. The roles of pastors are being questioned like never before. People are starting to doubt their pastors. But let me tell you something. I think this is a good thing, and let me tell you why. Because the church needs to realize that even the high-profile anointed ministers are capable of sin and brokenness. And with this new humility pastors will have and their lack of trust in them, maybe the church will turn back to Jesus as the head of the church again, and we will look less to men. Do not believe the lies of the enemy 
There are many great pastors who are godly men. My pastor is one of them. My brother-in-laws are great pastors and honest men of God. And there are many great churches with no scandals, plenty of them. However, we might have put too much faith in men. And we need to go back to Jesus being the head of the church again. So we're going to start to look at the videos from the Advocate Group. But before we do, the Mike Bickle allegations broke in October 2024. But at the time the allegations broke, they were dealing with an in-house scandal within IHOP that has not really been brought to light that will be brought right in these videos. Let's see what happened here that preceded the whole Mike Bickle scandal unraveling. This is ugly, folks. I'm giving you a heads up. I already knew the story of the husband who is, his marriage has been destroyed as a result of this. And the truth is that Mike had six years of very questionable interaction with his wife prior to Mike's son having an affair with his wife. So that man in double fashion was destroyed by Mike's influence on his wife and his son's affair with his wife. That's a problem. The fact that Mike's son was engaged in this sinful activity and two lives are being destroyed, two families are being destroyed, both having ended in divorce now, uh, and not even realizing how long it had been going on then, and over the next period for me of about 15 to 18 months, it's still going on and still going on, and nothing is being resolved. The ELT should have been read into that early in the process and to find out that this culture of silence and the, the engagement only on a need to know basis. So you see in here, Dean explaining that basically even before the Mike Bickle situation broke and made headlines, his son was involved in an adulterous affair that destroyed two families. And it seems like from what Dean was saying, this was being covered up. So Dean basically finds and starts to get really uncomfortable with this situation and ends up resigning. Let's hear Dean's thoughts on that. In it, he simply said, the black horse isn't gossip, it's perversion, and I'm not okay with this. The way this situation has been handled between these two couples, the silence, the appearance of cover-up, and the issues related to that, it's not okay pastorally, it's not okay organizationally, it's not okay managerially. I had allowed myself for 15 to 18 months to be caught up in the fog of the nuance of all the, the moral ambiguities and the process ambiguities and the Matthew 18 double talk and the way uh, uh, evidence wasn't considered evidence and, and the degree to which this was made unresolvable and kept uh, private from the ELT. That was the first time those names and that situation in four years had ever been mentioned to the ELT. And it just became shockingly clear. The elephant has finally been named in the room, and we aren't okay with this. I wrote a four-page resignation letter. I read it personally to Mike and Stuart. At the time, I reinforced my own belief and confidence in their individual integrity and that they were trying to do the right thing, but I made it clear in no uncertain terms that pastorally and procedurally, this is a disaster. There is a scandal here that looks like a cover-up, and this has not been handled well and will come back to bite IHOP, and I implored them to do something about this and handle it differently. But I basically resigned saying, I have tried to stand on the inside with you, but I don't know how to stand on the inside when I am intentionally kept on the outside. Okay, so you're seeing that that this affair went on with Mike's son for years and it was being covered up. The ELT didn't even know about it. It wasn't brought to his attention until he really pressed the matter. And so this issue of silence within the church, and it's due to honor culture because we're supposed to honor our leaders, and you should absolutely honor your leaders, by the way. But if something is wrong, you need to say something. You need to speak out. I live in New York City, and they, f and they funded this whole campaign after 9-11 where it said, if you see something, say something. Don't stay quiet. And so Dean is sitting here saying there was this whole culture of secrecy and these things going on that I wasn't okay with, and I couldn't ignore it anymore. 
So if you're at your church and you see things going on, say something. So now we're going to split switch to a different set of interviews with Alan Hood and Dwayne Roberts, where they're going to explain in a quick clip what exactly led to the whole Mike, Mike Bickle situation unraveling. Individuals that would come forth with that type of language that has been for years. Yeah. Not, it's not just a one or a two. It's been it's been said to several people. That specific phrase was used by multiple people. Or we heard that from multiple people that that phrase was used in a manipulative way towards a woman. And and so that is the common thread. And and, and a few others who said they were being groomed. They're oh. convinced they're being groomed. Oh, there there would be I would I would put in the category a lot would say that they had a grooming type or a being groomed relationship with Mike at different levels and kind of different levels, you know, in the journey. So you're seeing here the advocate group starts to get this information that Mike Bickle is using prophetic words in manipulative fashion, saying that his wife was going to die and that they were going to be married in the future. And this was done with many women. Folks, this is ugly and this is sick. And thank God that this is coming to light, because the Bible says that he who conceals sin will not prosper. God wants this sin out in the open so he can bring healing and restoration to these people. So these allegations come to light, and then they begin to start, these ELT members begin to start pressing Mike on the issue, and you're going to hear Mike's response. It was when Jane Doe's husband goes to Mike uh, Dwayne, you know, you were you were there that 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 morning and attempted to meet with them as well. Mike resisted Dwayne to be a part of that meeting. Uh, that was another thing that I realized that he had done in other situations where he refused to meet with anybody but just the one person. I think that's a big point. It's a huge point. It's a huge point because because um, Mike's ability <clears throat> to communicate is quite powerful, and we all know that. But he won't meet with two people. He'll only meet with one and person. I, and I had heard that from, you know, what he had done with my friend that was going through the, the divorce, you know, a, a divorce in the IHOP world just, you know, years before this. I had heard that same thing where he had refused another senior leader to meet in the presence of, of this husband. Okay, so you're seeing here the leaders start approaching Mike and trying to get meetings with him and he won't meet with more than one person. He'll only meet directly. And so they saw this as a red flag. They're starting to press Mike, starting to bring down pressure on him about finally confronting him about this thing. And he's not allowing the process to happen. Right. And now we're and accountable then, to that. And now what follows on top of that, because he had been preaching on betrayal and false accusation for weeks, he goes after that October 9th and 10th and preaches on that Friday and spiritually manipulates, mm -hmm. you know, 2 million people on WebStream because the big knock was Jane Doe is sharing too much as she's processing this trauma and coming to terms with it all. But if Jane Doe shared to, to 20 of us on that night, he preached to millions. Right and set a context of division yeah and that alone so if it was hearing her being shocked in and going i'm not sure i've never seen this side then how he responded and lied mm -hmm. to the husband and then spiritually manipulated in the email then the third thing was the preaching right. on the friday and that was when i said i cannot be silent mm -hmm. this cannot go on mm -hmm. Okay, so you're seeing here, they bring the charges against Mike. They're presented to him. He's not wanting to meet with these people. He's stonewalling and allowing any type of confrontation to go down. And then Mike decides to go and preach the famous Black Horse sermon in front of IHOP, saying that there was a spiritual attack coming on IHOP, and it was going to be the accuser of the brethren, a spirit of accusation that was going to come against Mike. And they said, these guys realized that's when this really it was going to turn into a big fight with them. 
So now the whole thing in all of this was the Matthew 18 process, the Matthew 18 process, and how we should, the Bible clearly lays out this format for us to go to a brother when we're offended. And so they're going to explain that. So we've seen here how they already tried to go to Mike directly, and that didn't work. And so basically now they're getting more people involved, bringing more people into the mix in order to put pressure on the situation. They're going to talk about Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is really irrelevant. You would never send an alleged victim to their alleged perpetrator to confront them one-on-one. You would never send a rape victim to a rapist to confront them one-on-one. Matthew 18 is not the one size fits all verse in the Bible for every situation. In the body of Christ, you can do a simple, simple Google search and find out what situations Matthew 18 does not apply for in the body of Christ will shout at you. It doesn't apply to a senior leader who has potentially abused a follower who was 19. Hmm. Never. And most people wouldn't even recommend the husband go to him because that's a good way for a leader to get shot, just to be honest, 100%. to send a husband to confront. That, that's outrageous. Yeah. So you're seeing here, Mike wanted to rigidly follow the Matthew 18 process and decided that he wanted to meet with the victim's husband directly. And Alan was saying, that's not a good idea. Matthew 18 doesn't apply to everyone. I totally agree. It does not apply to everything, especially if somebody's been abused in a situation. I got to say, watching these videos really help me trust these guys from the advocacy group. I always wondered if there was a small bit of resentment or bitterness or anger that they had held towards Mike in the back of my heart. I didn't really say that. But when I watched these videos and I seen the, the demeanor and the process that they went about this, they really do really care about IHOP and Mike and the ministry, and I feel like they really are trying to help out. So Alan is saying, now we, we go through this Matthew 18 process not really working, and basically Mike is not allowing any process to really go down. He's wanting to meet with people directly. They didn't think that was a good idea, and so they're in a bad situation. Now they're going to explain a little more. If Mike would have confessed the truth, to the husband, none of us would be here. If Mike would have then confessed and entered into a process for his brothers to gently restore him and walk through a period of getting to the truth and how deep this is in a spirit of contrition and humility, none of us would be here. Mm. That preaching on betrayal and false accusation coupled with the black horse prophecy and the angel Gabriel did great harm to the body of Christ. It set up this adversarial relationship of legitimate concerns coming forth would be now viewed as this demonic assault on Mike Bickle's chosenness before God in his ministry. That's not, that created so much angst and we have never recovered from the lies lies i've heard everyone want to critique the the alleged victim the survivor from my perspective and yet no one's calling out the lying the lies the, the manipulation the spiritual abuse to paint this picture that created division Okay, so you're seeing here how this whole thing could have been avoided. They're basically, in a nice way, putting the pressure back on Mike. If when he was confronted, he simply just confessed, this wouldn't have been the media storm that, that turned into all-encompassing situation with millions of people with their eyes on IHOP. But Mike continued to stonewall, which basically then spiraled and made them have to put out more... Uh, more content to get more eyes on the situation. If Mike had just confessed, it would have been just help this whole situation. So they're going to give more reasons to why the situation just got ugly. All of us here would want Galatians 6. Yes. We would want to restore a brother in a, in a spirit of gentleness. Yes. But you can't do that without genuine repentance. Yes. Therefore, 1 Timothy 5 
<laughs> which is now you have to say it to the whole church so that the fear would come upon all. So this was when many in the church, many established church leaders, and I should say the church leaders of the old guard, basically came up against these guys on the advocacy group saying that they were Absaloms, that they were basically trying to do this to, to take IHOP and Mike down because of bitterness. And the truth was, is what he's saying is, you can't restore someone who won't own up to it. And a lot of times when people are caught they don't want to own up to it, and that's what really made this situation become as big of a thing as it was, and it wasn't necessary. Had Mike just owned this stuff right up front, we wouldn't be here, as he said. I actually think it's a Psalm 51 repentance moment, and Nathan has showed up at your door, and you've mistaken it. Don't miss your window to repent. Hmm. This is God's kindness. It's they're not Absalons coming to you. They're coming in the spirit of honesty and integrity and sincerity. And his response, I, I just, still to this day, I'm broken about it and don't know where to categorize that. I just love the heart of Alan Hood. He's someone that I've looked to through this whole entire process, and I feel like the Holy Spirit has revealed to me that I can trust him, that he's a father-like figure, that he really loves Mike, he really loves IHOP, and he really wants to see the best for everybody involved. So the, they're going to address now, is this some conspiracy to take Mike Bickle and IHOP down? Because many people have accused these men of this. I know Rick Joyner came forward and said, at the end of the day, there's going to be a nothing burger, that these are Absaloms, that, um, that basically nothing is going to become of any of this. Now, Rick did apologize. However, many other leaders as well stood up and stood up for Mike um, when it, it, it seems like he's totally guilty at this point. So is, was this just a conspiracy? And you're going to hear these guys answer those charges. So to answer your question, no, there's not a conspiracy to take over IHOP. You know, I left IHOP in 2015. I'm in St. Louis, pastor in a church, you know, very grateful to be there, incredibly healthy church. I've had great relationship with IHOP and even Mike up until this past summer. So I have no reason at all to have any angst to come against IHOP, to come against my friends that I've known for 20 years that are leaders there now, even Mike himself. So that idea that this is somehow some kind of plotted thing is just ridiculous. This is about standing with friends that have legitimate, credible allegations and then beginning to see your spiritual father maneuver, manipulate, and threaten and intimidate. And it's about, whoa, no, this is about exposing wickedness that is within the church, period. It has nothing to do with conspiracy. I'm at St. Louis, Brian is in Denver, Alan is in Florida. Okay, so you get to hear their heart of motivation for all of this. These three men were all with IHOP 20 plus years. And Wes Martin right here who was speaking was saying that he was just with Mike a couple of months before the allegations broke and their relationship was in a good place. But he's saying this is about exposing wickedness. This is not a conspiracy theory. So now the next question is, what does this group want? What are they hoping to accomplish with all of this? And it's a very important question. Let's get into it. What, what do you want? Because I've heard people want money. They, they want, they're, right. they're engaging in cancel culture. Right. No, I, 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 want, I want the truth. What we have seen from Mike in these last couple of months now is somebody that has had a double life. Somebody that has kept hidden, again, not moral failure. That's part of it. Way more. The ability to manipulate, threaten, coerce, and intimidate speaks of something that is within a person that is not fit for any kind of shepherding or pastoring. I want to see that exposed because when that is not exposed, it just creates rot within the church. So as a shepherd of a body of Christ and a, a, you know, within the body of Christ, I want to see real genuine shepherding and I want to see false shepherding exposed 
because of the harm that it brings to the church. Okay, great point by Wes, talking about a pastor's heart. A lot of people see pastors as someone that are with the sheep, but also past pastors must also protect the sheep from wolves. And times that means going to war. And that means working to get rid of things that would attack the sheep. And there are times to fight. And so they're explaining exactly what they're hoping for. They want to see the truth. They want to see exposure here because it's necessary, because this was just so filled with lies and multi-layers of lies. So the next clip, they're going to get into why they want an investigation. Up to this point, this has been now a few months, and there has not been an investigation that both the advocate group and IHOP have agreed upon. They are holding out, and I think rightfully so, because IHOP is conducting the investigation with lawyers. And I think what they're looking for is more uh, uh, some type of organization that both of them come together and pick so that they see that IHOP doesn't have a hand in it, that it's a true third party investigation. But we're going to explain here why they feel they need an investigation. There's levels of all kinds of levels, you know, legal ramifications, defamation lawsuits, civil lawsuits by victims. And we're missing the reality of the church and who the church should be and what the church should do. We have a situation of spiritual manipulation and at the least sexual immorality and to, depending and then wrangling over terms, whether sexual abuse or sexual indiscretion, it's clouding the issue. There has been mass violation and sin that has been hidden and covered up and could have other implications for other sin that we don't even know about, which we don't have the ability to investigate. But we need help and we need to admit we need help. And we have all these wranglings and lawyering and this and that and that to cover up the fact there's been hiddenness, lying, self-preservation, and we haven't been able to get to the truth, which is we need to bring in what is acceptable neutral third-party investigation where it's agreed upon by both the alleged victim and the survivor or whatever term they're wrangling over now and and the IHOP KCELT and we need to be able to empower them agree on the scope make it transparent and set it up for other potential victims if they have to come forward in a safe atmosphere so that we can all go back to praying together and believing together because nobody has any desire to see IHOP KC. I preached on 24-7 my whole entire life. Okay, so you're seeing his call for an investigation, and it's got to be one that they both agree on, and they haven't been able to do that at this point. So IHOP has just decided to do go I forward see? without their help to basically, to, and they pick their own people, and it's just, this whole thing is just a disaster. So one more clip from Alan, and then I'll give you some final thoughts and we'll close. Do I want to see Mike Bickle taken out? No, I want to see Mike Bickle's soul right before God and right before his brethren. I want to see the church work and to act like there's no knowledge that the church has learned in the last 30 years with the Catholic abuses and all the ones we've mentioned. Yeah. No, there is a common group. There's common knowledge that we can enact that creates a safe environment so we can move forward. Okay, so you're seeing here just like a sinister plot with multi-layers of lies and sins and cover-ups. And let me just tell you something, guys. Often the talk has been on revival, how we want to see a third great awakening, how we want to see a massive revival hit our churches. And a lot of people have questioned the motives of my heart for doing a video like this. Why are you doing this? A, it kind of fell in my lap. This is a ministry I loved and then this unraveled. Okay. And the other situations that I covered in the past kind of just fell into my lap and I couldn't ignore the, the, that truth needed to be spoken on these issues. And basically that situation was a disaster, one form of situation. I had to get a lawyer. I had to get all sorts of legal protections and things like that. And that situation unraveled 
one of the top organ Christian organizations in America, and basically unraveled into several different churches and different ministers and pastors. Just one situation un unleashed a dirt trail of about 15 different ministries, churches, and pastors that just went on for miles. I became so overwhelmed. And so we got major issues in the church, a major sin problem, and there's going to be no great revival. There's going to be no, no massive move of God while this stuff is going on in the church. If Jesus would return at this particular point, we'd all be in trouble. God is coming back for a spotless bride, and he is bringing these things to light so we can get these situations cleaned up so that there can be another great awakening. A lot of people just want to move on to revival. Well, this is the painful pause before I feel that there will be a great revival. But first, there has to be a cleaning and a cleansing through the house of God. As Peter said, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. And there's a lot of comments on my videos. Don't judge. Don't judge. We're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge. Jesus, at those points, was talking to individual believers. In 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, it says we are not to judge the world, but we are absolutely to judge in the church. Because if we didn't, it would create a culture of permissiveness and things would get out of hand. We have to deal with things in the church, but God wants us to do it in the right spirit, with righteousness, and with humility and gentleness so that everybody can be restored that's involved. But before there is a great re revival in this country, we need to clean up these messes and realize that churches all across America have massive unhealthy cultures with sexual sexuality and these sexual scandals going on that are just happening more and more and we guys we guys got we got to get this stuff cleaned up. And so I'm going to be dropping another video or two again based on more content from this video. It's kind of talking about where they are and the investigation I'm going to release that soon. Thank you very much. If you like the video today, please share it on social media, help get the word out, hit the thumbs up if you like. If you like the content and want to support the channel so I can do other videos like that, you can find that in the description section of the video. That would be greatly appreciated. Let me just close in a quick word of prayer, right, for all this situation. So, Lord, we just come before you tonight and we just notice that you are in a place of exposing things in the church right now bringing things to light. And this is uncomfortable and this is ugly, but this is because you want us to get healing. You want us to get healthy. You want us to come back to you, to put the focus back on Jesus. And so that you can send a next great third awakening to this country and that I feel will go out to the rest of the world. So let us embrace this time. Let us not rush through this, God, because it's painful and uncomfortable. Let's go through the cleaning. Let's go through the refining so we could come out on the other side tested and as pure gold. So we ask you that you would have your way for IHOP, for Mike Bickle, for the Advocate Group, for everybody at IHOP, for churches all across America that is watching this situation, that you would just bless everybody, keep everyone in peace, and that, God, that we would just trust you in this process, that you're bringing us and refining us and helping the church in this great hour. This is not something that's bad. It's something that's necessary. And let you just bring healing and restoration and cleansing to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today.